Welcome to your New York Auto Show 2013 coverage. I'm Michael Artsis here at the Javits Center in New York City. We're at the Audi booth, or some people would say Audi. David Kiley, the editor-in-chief of AOL Autos, is joining us. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. I appreciate do you, it. Do you say Audi or Audi? I say Audi. And, and the Germans say Audi? Or? I think they say Audi in the Midwest. In the Midwest. <laughs> All right, so I'll be a Midwestern, Midwesterner for the day. Um, what do you think of the auto show so far? Has it been exciting? Has it been what you've expected this year? It's been a really strong show. You know, the New York Auto Show, to me, is really known for luxury. Because New York City, financial capital of the world, this is where the money is. So it's a very important show for luxury. And we're seeing diverse luxury. Like, we're seeing really great stuff, obviously, from Bentley, from Rolls-Royce. Um, but we're also seeing really strong stuff from SRT, which is, uh, used to be Dodge, but now they've broken out that brand. So the SRT Viper, which is, you know, $100,000, dollars uh, real Detroit muscle car. Uh, you see uh, a new Camaro, uh, which is, you know, attracting people with money and a little higher education since they cleaned up the design. Uh, a really good new Cadillac CTS, which is kind of my personal uh, car of the show for me. The, the CTS, to me, and the Cadillac lineup has been really surprising, and it's made me want to buy American again. I mean, I have pride for America. I always have. I've wanted to buy American for years, but never felt that there was anything that was out there that I wanted to buy. The Cadillac lineup makes me feel like there's something American I want to buy. The Camaro makes me feel like there's something American I want to buy. And I love what they did with the Camaro, and I've driven it. The SS is phenomenal. Um, what about the Viper, though? You mentioned the Viper. The knock for years has always been that it's fast forward, not great on turns, and built very tinny and plasticky and rattly. This new SRT Viper. Uh, drives like a dream. I, I've had it, and I would definitely, you know, if I was shopping in that space, I would definitely get it. You know, the thing about Detroit, uh, Detroit still does some things great, better than the Germans and the, and the Asians do, which is they absolutely do pickup trucks better than anybody in the world. And the second thing they do are these iconic muscle cars, like Ford Mustang, which is in its 50th year, the, the, the new Camaro. The, uh, the Dodge Charger Super B. These, these are fun, fun muscle cars, performance cars. This, these are uniquely Detroit products. Nobody does them better. You know what's funny about that is that, you know, I love cars. I love Ferraris. I love Porsches. I love all sorts of exotics, but there is nothing that puts a smile on my face like when I see a muscle car, whether it be a Shelby GT500, an old Mustang, the bullet car, whether it be a Charger, a Challenger. I just saw the other day, we were about to do a shoot, I yelled out to my camera guy because we were in a in a an open space, there was a glass window behind him, and I, I yelled, <laughs> I can't even believe I yelled this out. I'm like, look at the Roadrunner, look at the Roadrunner, and everybody in the place thought I was nuts. And he turned around, and you know, to me, I was so excited, and this Roadrunner just went flying by. and. Um, you know, there's not, like I said, there's nothing like a muscle car to put a smile on my face. I think not only riding in it, but seeing them. What do you think makes the muscle car so special? I think that it taps into something. I, what I said before, I think when, when you realize that the, the America and the U.S. automakers do something better than anybody else in a way that nobody else can really copy or emulate, that's actually part of the appeal for, for people who are from here. But even... The Mustang and Camaro also have great admirers overseas, too. So in, in the Far East and, and in Europe, there's a lot of people who really love it. But if you go to the Ford stand and you see the red and uh, blue convertible uh, Mustang GTs, uh, I defy you not to want to get in one and drive it away on a sunny day. Uh, they're, they're phenomenal. They're phenomenal. And I, I will tell you that I think that the older cars were built really, really well. The old muscle cars, they, like the fit and finish was great. And now I think the Detroit is starting to get back into that again. And because these new cars, the new Mustangs, the ones you're talking about, the new Camaros, I haven't seen the Viper yet, but the new cars are really done well. The fit and finish is tight and it's nice and it's exciting. So with that said, mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you what your favorite muscle car of all time is. Wow. Favorite of all time. I have to say it's the uh, it's it's the it's what I call the McQueen Mustang, the original, the fastback Mustang from from uh, 67, 68, and I was a big Steve McQueen fan, so 
if I if I hit the Powerball and could uh, and can get a collectible, uh, could afford that, that's that's what I would get. I love that car, and I just saw an episode of Pawn Stars where uh, Rick bought uh, bought one of those. Uh, you know, somebody rebuilt it. I think they spent eighty grand back in sixty sixty eight mm -hmm. to modify the suspension and modify that car. And then McQueen drove a lot of those scenes. He drove he drove his own car. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, he insisted on it. And um, you know the the other car uh, I'm trying to remember. Fort Fairlane, I think. A, uh, no, I think it was a Dodge. Was it a Dodge? It a Do yeah, I think it was a Charger. Actually. No, I think it was a it was supposed to be a Charger, and I think it was a Ford because they had to deal with Ford or something. There was something there. No, now we got to go. Back. We're gonna look it up. We got to check our Wikipedia's, right? All right? Well, that's a good trivia question for you at home. In the meantime, what's your favorite all-time car? Wow, that is like asking somebody what their fa who their favorite child is. Um, I know it's hard. I got two. I'll give you two because I've got two. Right. I'm going to tell you my two. Mine is a '85 288 GTO from Ferrari. Never imported into this country, gray market, but it's like a 308 on steroids, twin turbocharger, V8. And the reason I like it is it's it's not a sleeper, but it's it's almost like a sleeper because it's not an F40, it's not an F50. It kind of a little bit flies under the radar, but still like lets you know that it's pretty badass. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm not one for the big supercars or the high, really high performance cars. I'm going to disappoint you in telling you what actually my favorite car of all time is. It wasn't going to be like a uh, an LM02, 002, because my, my other one is a is a uh, Gullwing, an original Gullwing. I actually uh, I I am a huge fan of the original Volkswagen Beetle. I, it was my first car, a 1964 Beetle, and one of these days I, I'm going to get a beautifully restored, like perfectly restored, either Volkswagen Beetle or Volkswagen Carmen Ghia convertible. Oh, the Carmen Ghia is beautiful. They're both beautiful. They actually are beautiful. They're works of art, and, and they were practical and functional, and they were just such workhorses. You have to love those cars. You really do. I like the history that's baked into uh, to the Volkswagen Beetle. And, and basically, the, the 911 is, you know, and the whole Porsche lineup is off of that, you know, it's, that's the lineage, right? So it really spawned that, and that's kind of amazing and impressive, too. My ideal garage would actually be the, uh, a beautifully restored Beetle or Carmen Ghia convertible on one side. I'd like to have the, uh, the late 60s uh, uh, Mustang fastback. And then I'd like to have a really good American uh, pickup truck, maybe, maybe even an old one that's like a little smaller and less, uh, less involved than they are today, less like, maybe like a 1970 F-Series or something. Well, I, I have to agree with that. I love the pickup trucks. I, I think they're amazing. And just because I'm a child of the 80s, i got to mention one other car, and that's the DeLorean, because I love the flux yeah. capacitor that uh, Doc Brown put in, and I am dying to go back to the future at some point in my life. So. Now, one, car, one, one <laughs> thing I wanted to mention about the auto show, every auto show has what I call the gimmick yeah. that gets a lot of attention. And so this, this year's gimmick is kind of funny to me. It's, a, it's an upgraded Honda Odyssey that has a built-in onboard vacuum cleaner. Now, I demonstrated it. It actually works fine. It's in the back. Is it powerful? I mean, because yes. does it does well, it really? It picked up, it picked up a, a cup full of Fruit Loops, you know, so that's pretty much the kind of thing you want. In a, in a minivan. In a minivan. Like, we still, I keep around the 2004 Odyssey that's all paid for. It's got 150,000 miles on it. I use it for the bikes and, and the sporting equipment and all that kind of thing. It's like your, your, your second garage. It is, a little bit, and it's like in lieu of, <laughs> Same storage a, bin. In lieu of a pickup truck. But um, I got to say, it's funny. I've never once wished there was a vacuum cleaner on board my minivan because, you know, you can stop anywhere, gas stations and car washes to, to vacuum your car. Even your own house. However, I have done an informal poll of moms that I know, and they think it's a great idea. So maybe, it, but it's the thing that just gotten a lot of buzz and chatter, and they were on the morning shows with it. So. See, here's the thing. When you first told me about that, uh, I said, do you really need a vacuum cleaner in your car? Can't we come up with something better as an add-on? But on the other hand, I thought to myself, you know what? I'm all about convenience, lightweight, things that are easy. And if I could turn my car on instead of dragging the vacuum cleaner out and finding an extension cord, it might just work. Well, it might just sell me on that. The onboard vacuum I demonstrated it seems to me to be something that would pick up the, you know, the cereal spills. And it's not a Dyson. And the dirt that is knocked off your, your kid's cleats or something, so like quick cleanup. 
But you're still going to want to go for, for the car wash vacuum or the vacuum in your garage and the driveway to give it a good, you know, a good cleaning. One of these days they'll get it there so it has the full power. Now, let's talk a little bit luxury. There's a lot of changes to a lot of luxury cars this year. First of all, Porsche is celebrating 50 years of the 911. Uh, but let's start with Land Rover, with the Range Rover, all new redesign, 2013, probably well overdue from a technology standpoint, but also from a design standpoint, although I, I love the outgoing Range Rover because, to me, it harkens back to the original body a lot and a lot of the styling cues. The new Range Rover is a great looking piece of work. Um, I, I, you know, I'm a retro guy, so I, if I was going to, I like a 60s <laughs> Land Rover, but New York City is the biggest market in the world for Range Rover, uh, despite the fact that I don't see a lot of mountains to climb or dry creek beds to crawl. Oh, you know, or, Kim Kardashian has to go in style. Come exactly. On. exactly. Um, one of the things I like about it is that they, with uh, the use of aluminum, they knocked about 800 pounds off of this uh, Range Rover versus the outgoing one, which kind of, you know was kind of an embarrassment when you would see the MPG. Uh, Thing, sort of clicking 12, 13, 14, you know, I mean, I know a lot of people don't care about that, but I do. So well, this... I mean, they should, and if they shouldn't, you know, obviously if, you, if you're in the market for a Range Rover, you're not so concerned with how much the gas actually costs, but you should be concerned with the environment and what you're doing and making less of a carbon footprint. But beyond that, it's, uh, it's a really nice piece of design work inside and out. It looks like money, it feels like money, and... Uh, <laughs> And it sounds like a rapper. And it gets and it gets better uh, gets better fuel economy. So it's uh, but it's really a stylish piece of work. I actually love the Range Rover. I think it is the best SUV and truck on the market. It should be for the price, but there are other trucks out there that are you know similar priced. My favorite feature ever on the Range Rover is the fact that the windshield has a defrosting feature like the back windshield of every other car, but you can't see the lines in it, and you, so you don't need to use the blower, which to me. It's the most annoying thing in the winter to have this air blowing in my face so I can actually see out my windshield. To be able to have a windshield where I can see out of it and defrost it without having this blower is phenomenal. It's a great, uh, it's a great simple, I love the simple ideas like that, right? I mean, like, why didn't other people think of this already? You know, instead of having to wait for a, for a blower uh, defroster on the front. Um, simple ideas are the best, and I bet it costs actually very little money to put in. Yeah, until you break the windshield and they charge you four times as much for a new one Good or point. your insurance company. What about uh, Porsche? I mean, I love Porsche. Uh, I really I like what they've been doing in the past few years. Um, and now it's the 50th anniversary of the 911. Are you happy with the new body styling of the 911? I am. You know, Porsche is one of those cars that, uh, and one of those companies that almost never gets it wrong. Um, and it's interesting. We get 928? Uh, I said almost. <laughs> So, so you get 50 years of Porsche 911. It's interesting. Same year, you get 50 years of uh, Ford Mustang too this year. Um, but uh, Porsche is one of those cars that um, uh, it has a reputation. The 911 has a reputation of being, you know, the car for the guy who's trying to uh, make up for, you know, lack of equipment or something. But I actually have always found the 911 to be this classic, almost timeless well-tailored, marvelous performing vehicle that I would be totally down with having as my daily driver. You know, I was just in Seattle with a buddy who um, has a turbo, 2001 turbo, and he was driving it, and he was like, it's going to rain tomorrow, I'm not going to drive it. And I said, the car won't melt. He goes, they keep telling me that at the dealership. And I'm like, doesn't it rain every day in Seattle? And I said to him, I would drive this car every day if I owned it. And that's the thing, that's what I love about Porsche, is that you can get in it and drive it every single day. Yes, it costs a lot to maintain, but if you are in the market and can afford that, you can drive it every day and you really can get in it and go. And a lot of other exotics aren't like that. They're not comfortable, especially for every day. They're not drivable every day. They don't have all-wheel drive. Right. And the Porsche just, the 911 is just amazing that way. The nice thing about 911 is that it's not only fun to drive every day, but it's also reliable. I mean, it's not going to spend a lot of time in the shop like a lot of other exotics might. So in that way, it, it really makes for a great daily driver. Favorite car of the show? My favorite car of the show is the new Cadillac uh, CTS, and that's because of it has. A, there's a story there for me. You got Cadillac. Uh, you got General Motors coming out of, of bankruptcy and taxpayer federal ownership. 
Um, you've got the CTS that we have in the showrooms now, which I think looks a little long in the tooth. I wasn't really overly, overly happy with this design. But this new CTS really feels to me, it's classically tailored now, and I think it's going to look as fresh five years from now as it does today. Well, I got to tell you, I think you made an awesome pick, and I want to just know before, you, before we let you go, because I know you're super busy, what's your favorite experience of the show? Was it you know, going out to dinner with a bunch of colleagues? Was it not vacuuming? I know, it wasn't vacuuming the Odyssey, because you probably had flashbacks that this is what you're going to be doing later when you get home, um, but, or premonitions. Um, but what's your favorite experience of the show? You know, unfortunately, my favorite experience is not one that's going to be shared necessarily with, uh, with the public who comes. But uh, I, I ran into one of the marketing heads of Cadillac and also the overall marketing head of um, General Motors. And we had a really good, solid conversation for about 30, 40 minutes about um, where we really got into the into the weeds and into the details of, of Cadillac's uh, marketing issues, challenges, telling their story, retelling their story, telling their story in a fresh way. Cadillac's a really important American brand icon, and uh, I would really like to see it come back full strength uh, in the next few years to be, you know, something that Lexus and Mercedes, a brand that Lexus and Mercedes and BMW really take notice of. That would be nice. I mean, as you said, it was the premier American brand. I think it still is the premier American brand, but it's lost its luster to us and worldwide, and it'd be nice for it to recapture it. It really would. It'd be nice for people to say when, they, when they're young, when, when I grow up, I want to have a Cadillac again, you know? Yeah. And, and, and I think it became an older person's car. Now it's becoming young again, and, and I do really like what Cadillac is doing. Well, one of the things that happens in marketing and brands is that Often popularity of brands skips a generation, right? So it's like the old, the, 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 the analogy is the teenager who doesn't want to dress like his father, but he actually wants to dress his, like his grandfather and wear his grandfather's hat. You know, so now you've got baby boomers who really pushed Cadillac and Lincoln uh, and, and a lot of the domestic brands away, and they embraced Toyota and Honda and Nissan and so now their kids, who are Generation Y, we're seeing them having a lot more, being a lot more open-minded to buying an American brand because they don't necessarily want to buy their parents' brands. David Kiley, Editor-in-Chief of AOL Autos, thank you so much for joining us. I want to tell you real quick that that's funny that you say that because I want to dress like my grandfather. He was very dapper, wore a lot of suits, so I, I try and emulate that. And, and, and I like that analogy, and I think you're right. Thank you so much for joining us here Thank at the you. New York International Auto Show. Lots to see here, lots of great new stuff, Rolls, Bentley, Porsche, all the cars you fantasize about, Ferrari, Mercedes has got a lot of new stuff, BMW, the list just keeps coming, and, of course, Audi. We're at the Audi booth. I'm Michael Artsis. Thanks for watching. Be terrific.